very nice introduction, and I'm really glad to be here. Um, I brought a few cards, uh, probably not, definitely not enough for the class. These are just little cards of information because we've started our recruitment period for the year uh, on Monday, October 1st, and uh, it will conclude on November 15th. So there's a lot of time if any of you are interested, and I'll just leave these up here. You can pick one up, and if there aren't enough, um, just contact us or come by. We're in Ransom Hall, right across from the UC, kind of south of it, behind those big trees. We're on the first floor as you come in the door immediately to your left. So we're easy to find. Or call us or check out our, our email site uh, and website. So, um, this is a little bit more general. I did this presentation for Success U, which is for incoming freshmen and transfer students, QTA. But some of it's probably applicable to you, I would think, because uh, you may be wondering yourself whether, as an undergraduate, you want to get involved in research. You don't have to, obviously. Uh, it's above and beyond what you would do in your classes, where you might do some research and have to write a research paper. But in this program, you do a major research project, and you have to write a paper of some length, do an oral PowerPoint presentation on campus at the end of the summer, and uh, we have another you know, array of benefits to go with this. But research is good um, because it allows you to explore your major in a different way, right? Uh, not just reading out of the textbooks, uh, taking tests, you know, things of that nature, writing shorter papers. Um, if you haven't taken your upper level courses yet, most of the people who come into the McNair program are juniors. Some of them are seniors if they have enough semesters left. Occasionally we accept a sophomore. It is not open to freshmen. Uh, if you're a sophomore, before you do your research, and we're the classic McNair, did you do your research in the summer? I did. Yeah, that's the classic McNair approach, uh, where you know in the spring you find a mentor, you write your proposal, you do your reading, and then in the summer you carry out your research. And some people, you know, after they write their paper, etc., they may continue to do research, uh, especially if they're in a STEM field. They know the lab protocol. They know the people in the lab. They may continue to work there. Uh, in the liberal arts, not so often. Uh, but Can you tell them that, I mean, I know what STEM is, and many of them probably do, but then that's going to be sure. there to what that acronym is. Coming next. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. No, I'm that's sorry. a good question. You're anticipating what I'm going to talk okay. about. But getting to do research allows you to really get to know faculty, too, yeah. and grad students um, and postdocs. They're people who have a PhD, but they may go to study, and they also get paid. Uh, at another university for a year or maybe up to three. Um, so you get to know them, that's good for future recommendations, whether you're looking for a job or you're applying to grad school. Uh, scholarships, again, you need those recommendation levels, and networking, uh, job opportunities, internships, you know, they, they know a lot of people, so it's good to get to know them. And it will better prepare you for grad school if you're planning to go and it will make you more competitive on the job market. They look for these things, even if you don't go to grad school. So here is STEM. Um, and I'll tell you what, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. Okay, so social work is kind of its own sphere. Right. Um, then, you know, there are all these other majors at UTA, and the liberal arts, and uh, more professional things, too, in the School of Business. The McNair program is open to any major as long as you qualify, there are eligibility criteria, and you want to go on, and within 10 years, and this is where the tracking comes in, you will earn a PhD. Now, in addition to that, uh, the, the underlying goal is to open up the professoriate to a wider population. Uh, individuals who traditionally come from backgrounds where not that many people uh, from these students have gone on to advanced study. So, and I'll go over who that is for this program. So, it's it's really to, you know, expand opportunities for people. So, we want you to be seriously considering, you know, the possibility of teaching and doing research at the university level. So, in terms of research, you know, you don't need to be a STEM major. Uh, 
known to uh, need to be an upperclassman. There are other programs where you can get into earlier. And you can often get course credit. Okay, so. Yes, there we go. Um, also, um, some of the advantages are uh, that the more education you have, the higher your chances are for employment, uh, reduces your period of unemployment, your salary is greater, and that really accumulates over the years. So people with PhDs, I think their unemployment rate for a long time is 2%, and maybe a little bit above the rule of that now, but you know, it's, it's pretty easy to find a job. So STEM research, and I know you're not in STEM, but you know, STEM people typically work in labs, they work in teams, uh, they need special training typically, uh, often it's quantitative analysis that they're most, uh, you know, concerned with. And it is possible if you're in a STEM field as an undergraduate to publish your article, but you're going to be one of several authors in a, in a peer review journal I'm talking about. This That's is a where deal still as, as, as an undergraduate student. That's it is a big, big deal. deal. Yeah. And certainly not all McNair scholars are able to do this, but we have, you know, every year I think we have a few who manage to do that. Uh, we have one right now, Ryan Dingler, he's in uh, astrophysics, and he worked on his research with Dr. Manfred Kuntz in the physics department, and uh, it had something to do with giant stars and how they're formed and you know what contributes to their growth and it's pretty likely that they're going to get a publication out of that and his name dr coops is going to put his name first so that's wow. pretty unusual so yeah that's exciting when he um, time for doc doctor and all that that is going to be so helpful yeah that'll be very helpful yeah. so uh you know that's the gold standard it's hard to reach it but you know sometimes people uh, liberal arts, you know, some of this may apply to social work. Uh, researchers work alone, typically. Uh, they often also use primary and secondary documents. They may do surveys, interviews, observations. I would imagine that's pretty common in your field. Uh, the research can be qualitative or quantitative, you know, I would imagine. Yeah, you think we've already went over that. Sure. So, uh, either way, you would need IRB approval if you're working with human subjects. Yes. So that's the committee on campus that vets uh, all research proposals uh, to decide if they're exempt or if they're not. You know, then they have to go through some other processes. Um, I don't know what it's like to publish as an undergraduate in social work. Does it that happen very often? It, 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 the way that it typically happens, uh, and when I was the longest, um, Full time, I guess, was at um, SFA and Nacogdoches, but that we just didn't. The university microcosm was wonderful, but outside of the university, there's just not a whole lot to do. I've been to and getting to the airport, pies. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and getting it to the airport, you know, there it, it, yeah. it, it, it's kind of s scary a little bit, yes, it especially is based on what Small. you drive and all that, but. Um, all of these we do, and um, as a matter of fact, when I was at SFA, um, I was actually one of the advisors for the Undergraduate Research Conference. Oh, so wow. it wouldn't okay. it wouldn't be on the same magnitude as what you require for McNair, uh -huh. but it does allow uh, certain students out of each particular college of liberal arts mm -hmm. to write um, a, res uh, a study, a research, you know, study on the topic they're interested in, and then we pick them. But um, so it, it depends on um, how the institution sets it up. We've even in the School of Social Work, um, when I was down there, some of our like uh, research assistants, well, they'll be at the graduate level, but um, they were absolutely were on publications and have been on publications that I've been on. But I'm glad, um, Doctor, that you mentioned about number two there. And I, uh, I want you guys to take a look at that book as she continues on. Um, this is what, remember guys, when we were talking about like, um, you saw some of the articles that were called meta analysis or um, systematic review and things like that. Well, um, and then I'll, I'll have Dr. explain more. Um, that's, that's, that's an empirical study. But instead of the sample being people, the sample is articles and things like that. 
So this is absolutely what we do, but just not as much with the publications as the, the more hard, hard sciences. We've had people do a meta-analysis in your program. Yes. Right? They can nurse in one time. And they can because that's empirical research. It's rigorous and it's empirical. Just sure. because you're not doing a sample on people, you are you, you are still doing a sample and it has its own validity and reliability criteria with it. Right, exactly. Um, okay, well let's move on. Uh, so now I'm going into the McNair program a little more specifically. Whoops. Is this time or something? Oh, do you need to go back? Yeah. Okay, I'll just do it the most oh, way. Because that the the, 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 the the foundation was made posthumously because I believe because he was on a time way past with uh oh when I got there we go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, this is a photo of Dr. Ronald. Hughes. Because I wasn't in school when he was. I don't know that. Okay. <laughs> he was from South Carolina. Yes. From a very modest background. Yes. Uh, he was very talented. Uh, talented in music. He played the saxophone. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know and that. he really was kind of conflicted. He thought about majoring in music, but he also liked physics. So he went to Virginia Tech as an undergraduate. And then as a graduate student, he went on and earned his PhD from a very prestigious school, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. So, unfortunately, um, I should add here, he perished in oh, the Oh, they Do you know how to can fix that for Who can fix that for you? Can fix it out of your phone? What's going on? I didn't say oh, okay. mine. So we have one of our customers automatically. Yeah, it is a slideshow. Oh. Yeah. You might have a timer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's Uh, 
Research One institution. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's a good thing. Uh, and we uh, want students, ideally, whether this is realistic or not, this is what the Department of Education requires. They want our students to immediately start grad school, right after they graduate. So if you graduate in December, by the following fall. If you graduate in May, the summer. by the following fall, or not, or the summer, if you graduate in the summer. So I know a lot of students find that a little hard, uh, but you know that, that's the expectation. And so these are just pictures of different schools where we've had students go. And the benefits are the summer research internship, which you have to be a junior by the beginning of the summer, uh, and you work with a mentor, and you get a stipend of $3,000 to support you over the summer. And it also includes a scholarship for three credit hours of independent study, graded by your mentor. So if you look at a grade, not, not all programs do it this way, but presumably it will be an A, so you know that's, that's also good. And uh, you don't have to pay for that, it's 11 weeks. So we have conference travel. After you do your research, we wanna make sure that you're serious. So you have to come through the research experience successfully. But then we have money to send uh, students to conferences. And ideally, we would like them to present, but if they're not able to present, sometimes they just go for the experience. So we recently had two students go to um, the American Institute of Aeronautical Studies mm -hmm. conference in Orlando, Florida, and they were just amazed. There were so many uh, important and well-known uh, speakers. You know, they went to all these sessions. They had a really great time. And then one of our staff members went to an undergraduate McNair research conference, which, did you do that at all when you were an undergrad? Oh, yes, I, I was gonna say, I actually would our group we went to Penn State. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I don't know if they do that. Anymore. Yeah, they, they, think they, they probably do. don't. But yeah, that was one of the big ones. And that was actually my first time flying. I think I was maybe about 19. Yeah. And years. it is for some of our students, too. But yeah. Never been in but that stipend is so, so um, helpful. And yes. even as you give this presentation, there's several people that, that are in this classroom now that I think, and, and you'll go through the criteria. It's not just necessarily minorities no. that are criteria, but there are several uh, minorities or otherwise that I think would actually do quite well in this program. Yeah, well that's great. So uh, conference travel, we also have GRE prep. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the graduate record exam is kind of like the big sister to the SAT. You have to take, usually you have to take at least the general test. Uh, writing, math, uh, <coughs> verbal, vocabulary and in six areas there are still subject tests those are not taken on the computer they're paper and pencil tests typically offered in the university but they're kind of shrinking the numbers so if you're lucky maybe in your field there isn't anything social or any of that uh, we have you get free transcripts for your grad school application and a lot of schools will waive your application fees for graduate school so you can save a lot of money because we recommend you apply to six to 10 schools, okay? You want some choices, you want to spread the risk. You don't want to apply to, to all Ivy League schools like Harvard, Princeton, Yale. That's risky, right? So you can have your reach schools, some really demanding schools, some mid-range schools in terms of, you know, your chances of getting in and then maybe one or two backup schools that you're pretty certain you can get into. But they're still good schools and you know you'd be willing to go there so at any rate uh, lots of benefits uh, we help you we go over how to apply we have seminars uh, last Friday we had a seminar on writing your personal statement yes. for admittance to graduate school and how to ask for and get strong letters of recommendation from individuals and this coming Friday we have one on graduate funding different sources, how to approach that, you know, what it's like, um, where it comes That's from. It's interesting because when I was there, they've had these humongous books that are just oh, overwhelming really? about, you know, um, how to obtain funding, but I found mm -hmm. it so cumbersome because the books, I mean, you know, and it's probably better now since it's, it's probably more electronic, you can find more sources, but you oh, know. Yeah. Yeah, so. did, the, did the program put a book together for you? 
Or they just gave you a scholarship? No, it was just one one of those, you know, standard ones that right. got through the U.S. This is what right. we offer. Yeah. Yes. It is so much easier now because so many things are online. So that's really good. Um, and many schools offer fellowships, you know, like a fellowship is like a scholarship but at the graduate level. So in addition to waiving the application fees, they may offer you some kind of, you know, funding, at least for the first year, maybe later. Uh, because there are about 180-something McNair scholars programs right now throughout the U.S. There are about 15 or 16 in Texas. Uh, there's one at TCU. There's one at UMT, there's one at Texas Women's, Texas Tech, Adeline Christian, Our Lady of the Lake, um, UT Austin, Lamar, and I may be forgetting some, but you know, Texas is a big state, so we have a lot of them. Um, at any rate, the eligibility. So we obviously we're looking for people who pretty strongly feel they want to get a PhD, not just a master's. Uh, that's not what this program is. You can get a master's first and then get a PhD, that's fine. Uh, you need to be a UTA undergrad, obviously. Any major, uh, as long as you're shooting for the PhD. We're looking for a cumulative UTA GPA of around 3.0. And this is an older presentation. So we pull your grades at the end of this fall semester to see how you do. Uh, you need to be a US citizen or a permanent resident. So this is not open to international students which I know is disappointing to our many international students, but all TRIO programs, you have to be either a permanent resident or a U.S. citizen. Uh, and then the last criteria that, that you were alluding to is to be a first-generation college student and from a low, moderate household income. So you, you have to have both of those. Or you can be a member of one of several underrepresented groups that have not traditionally sent a lot of members on to advanced study. So that would be African American, Hispanic, uh, Native American, which also includes Alaskan, Hawaiian, and American Pacific Islander. So, and a lot of our students are all three. They're first generation, they're low income, and they're from an underrepresented group. And, so, and may, and may I um, add a little? Sure. Yes, um, please. Two things. I remember when I was in the there, there was uh, a lady, and she, was probably around my age, but the, the, the rest of us were traditional age college students. Do you, do they still, do you guys still consider um, non-traditional students as a part of that as well? Yeah, but if a person comes in and they're 65 and they don't have a BA or a BS yet or something, well, yeah, well, yeah, I would yeah, just kind of, well, why, why do you want a PhD? Because by the time you're done, well, this lady was, was, was in her thirties, but the rest oh, of us were like it. early, yeah. I, I had yeah, I mean, in their forties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forties, sure. Um, and also, uh, this is the second question. What if um, some persons who, they are American, um, say for instance, they may have just obtained their American citizenship. They're still American, though. Would that qualify yeah. if they were? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, As, and even if they're permanent residents on the way to become Fabulous. Yeah. Okay. But international students, uh, no. right? So, yeah, we and we will check on that uh, that status because we have to be careful right. that we don't admit people who do not meet the eligibility right. criteria. So, and these are some pictures of some of our recent students. Claudia Martinez uh, graduated in December 2018. No, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is December. Um, it must have been. <coughs> I think actually she graduated, graduated in December 2017, but she's a 17-18 academic year class. And she was a Spanish major. She was very active on campus. Uh, she did the leadership minor, and she was involved in all kinds of groups. And she is now at the University of California, Berkeley, this fall in a Spanish doctoral program fully funded. So she was a pretty impressive student. Yeah. And Sarah Watson, um, she graduated a little bit earlier. She was an anthropology major, and she did her research with Dr. Naomi Clegghorn, I don't know if you've heard of her, who works with um, 
you know, ancient, she's an archaeologist, she goes to South Africa and she's working in some of these cave sites along the coast where they found remains of very early civilizations. Yes. So it's, it's very interesting and, and Sarah uh, did her research with her and she got into the University of California at Davis and she won last year, she's already got a master's and she won, um, what did she get, a National Science Foundation Research Fellowship, which is like $32,000 a year for three really? years. Yeah, and we have another student, uh, Maya Oluwoyan, um, she's in math, she also won one. So they're kind of hard to get, but if you get one, they're really great. So she's already been all over the place, you know, talking, researching, etc. What has so, she done in, um, now in Australia? Did she look at um, ancient um, I'm not sure. The, okay. I'm not sure what she did in Australia, but what she's working on as a grad student is something about the heat treatment of uh, stone. Yes as it was used for artifacts, you know, like tools, yes. early man, heating the stone and left. Bad enough, you can do it. Okay, it may not be easy, but it can be done. One of my favorite quotes is, you will win if you don't quit. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, and I think that, yeah, questions. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put that in there, my colleague did. But I love you, that was what I saw what I was thinking of. So guys, let's, let's, um, any questions? I have a few questions um, because I know just for many of you, uh, I think this would be a wonderful experience for you. And um, um, I can just talk, you know, I can even just speak on my, um, you know, experiences with it. Um, and even though UTA is a tier, tier one research institution, my undergrad, my um, McNair Scholars Program was at um, an HBCU. You all know what an HBCU is, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us who doesn't, if you don't know what that is. It's a historically black college and university. But the good thing about it is that the same curriculum, the same rigor that is provided at an institution like this, that I'm actually, this is where I received my PhD from. Um, and, you know, it, it, the consistency amongst what you learn in the mentorship and things are so important. And, and, and while you're talking about the conferences with the students, I remember so well, um, I believe that when, when, because they're famous people that come and speak, you know, uh -huh. and, and, and I'll be uh, frank, you know, I really wasn't listening to all that he, that he had to say. I mean, you know, I was, you know, I was 19 or so, but Dr. Ben Carson came and spoke at ours in Penn State, you know, and um, don't be intimidated by, to put your applications in, guys. Um, I've met lifelong friends that are still friends with now that went through the program. That's another important element to being in a program like this. Yeah. Because that's happened to our students too. They tend to really bond. Yeah. You know, you go through the research process together and exactly. you know, commiserate with each other and you know, get strategies from each other. So that that's a big deal, you know, students have said that to us. So so you're another example of making lifelong friends. So, any questions about the, the application period goes till November 15. We have plenty of time. We put the application online oh, this, this year. year. So this is this is the first time. So we've tested it several times. So we hope everything's good with it. Um, so you can do everything online except if you're submitting financial documentation right. to us. If you're proving to us that you're low income in addition to first generation, you would have to bring that in. Um, we don't want that to go up on the website, obviously. So I encourage you to do this. Uh, it's also fun, right? It is. I mean, students have fun doing this. And the stipend in the summer, uh, we're going to get my young lady here first, then we're going to get Shanika. But um, during the summer, that really, really helps get in those. Well, yeah. as an undergraduate, I mean, right. I was broke. So, you know, it, it, it was really. Um, helpful in that regard. But I, 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 I'm picking on, on both of you young ladies because I, I went to a, um, well, all my young ladies, but, and, and you would know this, Dr. Ronhard, because um, you, you know, heard about it, as I've heard about it, as conferences things too, that there's this big pull or push for 
not only minority women, but Latina women to pursue higher education at the doctorate level. Especially in STEM. Yeah, oh, yeah, well, STEM across the board for all of us, but definitely. Yeah. So I was just curious, there's um, several of you that I think would be fabulous, and, and so I just wanted to know if you guys had any questions. You're, you're just two of them, there's some more here, too. Yeah, maybe I should, let me say one other thing. Yes, please. Because if you apply now, you cannot graduate for December 2019 okay. because you have to do a summer of research that right. will be this coming kind of summer and we want you to be in the program when you apply to grad school yes. which if you're going next year or a year from now you should be applying to grad school this semester yeah. so if you don't get into a program until the spring which is the normal trajectory here we would miss out on that so we've had people kind of postpone their graduation, mm -hmm. you know, like take fewer hours each semester yes. just so they can participate. Because so in the long run, it, it'll be so it's a good investment. Well right. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Some of you might be so far along, you know, like maybe graduating this semester or in May that, you know, you don't have time to do this. I should have said most of y'all are juniors, right? I think there's a couple seniors. I graduated. I graduated. I graduated. Oh, we graduated. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they would be. Oh, well, they can still think about it. Well, you can think about it if you're willing to push it yeah. back. I just like to see more, more, more diversity in it as well. Yeah. Did you all have? I know you have a Can y'all give up a question? Then I'm gonna get uh, to me, and then I'm gonna ask you all see. I just want to see more representation. It's well, all what would be considered low income if you have to do I there's a chart that we look at. It changes every year. It's issued by the federal government. Depends on how many people are in the family. Right. You know, and there are some qualifications. Like if you've lived in Hawaii or Alaska, it's different than well, the main like what if you, yeah. you do live with your family, but they don't give you money or anything, I guess. They, well, they it depends. Part of depends on how old you are and if you have a kid and if you're a veteran. There's a whole slew of qualifications. Okay. So, you know, if you're under 24, um, then you're considered dependent if you don't have any other reasons to be independent. But that's all in the application. You can look it over and, and see. You know, unless there's special circumstances and you've got some documentation for financial aid or something. There was only my sister, myself, and my mom that qualified. And then my, one of my really good girlfriends, and she's still my girlfriend to this day. I, don't, I told you guys about Charlotte, but she has like, she's the youngest, and they lived like in the country, and there was like 12 of them. Well, her dad had an extensive farm and everything, but because it was so many kids, that balance, you know, they kind of stratified or, or equaled out the sample a little bit. Yeah, and we look so, at taxable. Oh, yeah. After the du deductions have been taken and stuff, so, you know, that lowers it quite a bit. So, you know, if you have any questions, I'd say go in and look at the application or come talk to us. We can go over that with you and you know, questions about it. And if you're independent, you know, then unless you're married, you know, we need to know if you're married and all that, if there's another person. But if you're independent, uh, your parents are well, is it you mean that if someone's married, I mean, you could be married. Now, I know that you can't have children because Regina did. She was in her 30s and she had. Well, we've had people with kids. Yeah. I mean, but oh. her kids were like yeah. junior high or something like that. Yeah. So. Well, I know we've, we've seen, we've had sisters consecutively. Y yes. We've had a married couple at different times. Yes. They were in the park, so. If, you, if you're, I've been with it for 20 years, so I've seen a lot, of, yeah. a lot of, you know, different circumstances. So I may talk to you also just outside of this. Sure. You know, yeah. I'm interested in you know, how it works yeah. here. Yeah. And I am going to be talking to some of the people in here about it as well, based on yeah. yeah. the information <laughs> that, that you've shared with us today. Great. Okay, and this young lady had a question. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot about Shanique. I'm so sorry. I know. No, um, so when you say like the first generation, so does that, because I'm wondering, does that mean? What does that mean? Because now, like, yeah, I don't live with my parents anymore, and I have my own kids, so does that still consider? First generation, first generation yeah. is 
forever okay. if you're first generation. But what it means is that if either of your parents have a degree from a four-year institution, like UTA, you know, and they got it while you were living at home and growing up, you know, they had it before you grew up. And you have to be exposed to your parents, college-educated parents, before the age of 18. So if they got it after you were 18, you know, it's, it's not considered to be influential. But your parents, they, they can go to college. They could have gone. They could have even gotten an associate's degree. For our definition, your first generation, as long as your parents, neither of them, have a degree from a four-year institution. So it doesn't knock out any college attendance or even a community college degree. So, you know, there are different definitions of first generation, but that's ours, the one that we use. So hopefully some of you will be eligible and not uh, graduating too soon. But thank you for this opportunity. I don't want to take up too much of the class.